Um, I, I, um, I've been following the, the progress of H2O uh, for the past few years, so it's, it's really uh, special for me to be here and, and share some of the modeling work that, uh, that I've been able to do on top of, of H2O. Um, today I'm going to be talking about rule ensembles. Um, this is a, a modeling technique that is a descendant of uh, tree ensembles. Uh, these rule-based models often outperform the classic tree ensembles, but they are uh, much more interpretable. And the importance of model interpretability is, is now a central concern in, in data science research. We, we heard about it in, in different uh, talks yesterday. Um, and that's, that's what uh, called my attention to, to this model. Uh, a few years ago, I was working in the, in the semiconductor industry doing uh, defect analysis. And in that problem, the whole point of the modeling exercise is to understand. It's not to predict, but to understand. And so model interpretability was, was a key concern there. Um, it, this article on the New York Times uh, a couple of weeks ago caught, caught my attention it, uh, about the need for model interpretability. It goes on to, to uh, mention that um, next year some regulatory constraints in the EU will start uh, that demand that uh, decisions made by machines are um, explainable. All right. So the, the talk is as follows. I'll, I'll provide a timeline of some of the algorithmic developments that led to rule ensembles. Uh, I, I'll illustrate how we can use decision trees as, as a source for these rules. The rules can come from different places, but, but using uh, decision trees, it's, it's, a, it's a, um, one way of, of deriving candidate rules. And, and I'll show just, just a couple of equations defining rule ensembles. Then I'll have some performance comparison numbers uh, between rule ensembles and the uh, classic tree ensembles. Uh, then I'll show the, the how, how I leverage H2O to build these rule ensembles. And uh, I'll say a few, something about how we chose to deploy these models in productions, which is slightly different than, than the POYO or MOYO approach. And if time permits, that's the reason for bringing my, my young laptop. I, I wanted to show you some of the code and, and maybe the, show you the, uh, an output example. So um, rule ensembles started, or, or the, the lineage of rule ensembles started with CART. Again, I think decision trees were uh, very popular because they were highly interpretable. And some of the key uh, characteristics of decision trees, they do automatic variable selection, much like GBM or random forest do. Um, there wasn't a need to do a lot of data pre-processing the way you have to be careful about in linear models. They could handle missing values very elegantly. Uh, and, and as I say, they were highly interpretable. Uh, unfortunately, they, they were not very accurate. And, and so bagging is the first uh, attempt at uh, combining uh, decision trees or ensembling decision trees to improve on the accuracy. Uh, um, so keeping, keeping all the good stuff from decision trees, like handling missing values, being largely insensitive to outliers in the input distribution and things like that, uh, but being more accurate. And, and of course, when we combine, the question is, uh, how, how do we um, generate a diverse collection of things to be combined? And so, so this, this notion of diversity, which was later formalized, um, in the case of bagging, is achieved by, by doing a data distribution uh, perturbation via resampling. Uh, then shortly after that, the, the Adaboost algorithm came, and Adaboost does data perturbation not by resampling, but with observation weights. At, at its core, that's, that's uh, how uh, Adaboos is doing, uh, is achieving diversity. And uh, the, the success of Adaboos uh, was uh, uh, greatly um, 
uh, clarify with, with the publication of, in 2000 of, of the gradient boosting paper that, that also generalized other boost to um, any differentiable loss function. So that's, that's work from, from Professor Friedman and uh, Breiman in Berkeley, Professor Breiman uh, in Berkeley, he then put up an evolution of bagging where he increased the diversity of the trees that were being combined using this, uh, what I call algorithmic perturbation, right? He inserted this step where you sample from the variables that are being selected at every step. Again, the, what is being achieved through that mechanism is increase the diversity of the base learners that we are trying to combine. Um, and so at that point, uh, we had like at least these four different recipes for building three ensembles, right? Bagging, Adaboos, Random Forest, Gradient Boosting. And, and um, um, this, this paper, if, if you haven't seen it, the, the eyes paper, it, it, start, it stands for Important Sampling Learning Ensembles. It, it provided um, um, a unifying theory of uh, ensemble generation. So, so it's a highly illuminating paper. And it allows to view all these uh, uh, algorithms as special cases of, of a sort of meta-algorithm. And, and then, um, so remember I said CART had all these very attractive features, except that it was accurate, so we went to assembling to achieve accuracy. Uh, but what went out the window in that process was interpretability. And so rule ensembles uh, uh, come back or, or are proposed um, as an attempt to uh, recover interpretability. Um, um, and then, of course, rule ensembles became, uh, I argue rule ensembles became practical on very large data sets with, with the coordinate design algorithm, which is a way of computing solving the regularized. We'll, we'll see the, the role of regularization in rule ensembles uh, just, just a few years ago. So, so that's where we are. And so, all right. So um, let me illustrate how we can use decision trees to obtain human readable, readable rules and so this is an example of a, of a very simple regression tree on two variables. And um, the, the leaves, uh, since this is a regression tree, there is a constant associated with each of, these, uh, with each of the leaves in this tree, represented by, by the C sub i's. And um, in input space or in feature space, this region, so I'm, I'm using the, the same coloring scheme, the, the leaves of the decision trees define hyper rectangles in input space, right? And so since this is a regression tree, um, the, the y coordinate in this graph is, is the, the, uh, the constant, the estimate that is being made at each of these leaves. And so the, the, the height of each of these plateaus um, represents that, that constant. Now, uh, membership in each of these regions can be expressed by a simple function, right? Like, like in the case of region one, that membership function is it's, if x1 is greater than 22 and x2 is greater than 27, then one, meaning I belong to this hyper region, otherwise uh, I don't. Uh, similarly, say for region five, this is the way that membership function looks like. The, um, because this, uh, so these are, this is what I'm referring to when I talk about rules, because these are human readable statements about attributes of, of, the, of the input. Um, uh, an ensemble made of these rules, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be more interpretable. More formally, more formally, the, the functional form of a rule ensemble looks like this. Um, I had a pointer. <laughs> um, is there a pointer that I can borrow by any chance? Uh, nope. They're coming. And so the, the R sub M's, and, and, and so um, the R sub M's in this expression refers to, to the rules that, that we had 
in the, um, in the previous slide. And these rules are nonlinear, and they capture interactions between, between the, the, the features. Uh, but we supplement them with purely linear terms. Top one. And so, we, so again, we have the rules, and we are supplementing them with purely linear terms. So, so if this function was just like this, this is like the log odds in a logistic regression. And if, if you remember, linear, uh, linear targets are the worst case for, for decision trees and the worst case for ensembles of trees, because all you can do is to do like a staircase approximation to the, to the linear uh, function. And so, but in this framework, nothing prevents us from combining um, uh, basis functions from different families. In, in some sense, if, if you were at the stacking talk yesterday, the, the stacking equation looks like this, except that these basis functions in, in the stacking could be a GVM by itself, or it could be another random forest or something like that. And, and more generally, um, Additive expansions like this are very common in science and engineering, right? This could be an expansion on wavelets, um, uh, an expansion on, um, uh, for instance, an expansion on sigmoid units. So this could be the output of a hidden unit, and, and so this is just the, up, the output unit of a neural net. And so the, the basis function or the base learner just happens to be of a different type. And when you add this, there's, there's now a, a, a neural network architecture where you have these skip connections. And so higher, higher, um, higher layers still have access to the original input. And, and so that, that's essentially what is happening here. So of course, the, the magic in all this uh, uh, basis expansion is how, how do you pick the basis functions, right? Um, now. The coefficients in the case of rule ensembles, they are, they are determined via a regularized regression. And so once we have candidate rules, um, then we just need to fit these coefficients in, in a very standard, so this is a very uh, a standard formulation of regularized regression. Now, um, uh, we believe that regularization in this case um, um, not only reduces variance, regularization is understood as, as a variance uh, reduction technique, but it also, in this case, it reduces bias because uh, if the, the regularization post-processing allows us to be more liberal in the process of generating the candidate rules because the post-processing is giving us the, the confidence that if, if we end up generating a, a, a candidate rule that is overfitting in some corner of a space that, that doesn't generalize well, the, the regularization procedure is going to get rid of it. Um, all right. So here is a, a performance comparison on 60 regression problems. Uh, so I cannot show you performance comparisons on Amazon data sets. And so here I'm using uh, 60 uh, randomly generated target functions that I borrow from this 2001 paper from, from Friedman. The, the, uh, the, the way in this, these target functions are generated, like the, the amount of noise, the amount of interactions between the variables, and so on, uh, it, it's supposed to be very comprehensive. But, but I refer you to, to that paper to, uh, for more details. Again, this is a regression problem, and, and so I'm using a scale absolute error to compare them. Um, they they find uh, like this, and so lower values are better. Um, and so, a, again, I'm connecting the dots for easier visualization, but the, the problems have nothing to do with each other. Every dot is, is independent. And uh, e even though it's... it's uh, uh, unfair to try to generalize from a small uh, benchmark like this. Um, uh, however, the results are consistent with what the theory of important sampling suggests, namely that uh, GVM tends to outperform um, random forests, and the reason is that GVM does implicit feeding of the coefficients that are used to mix the trees. 
and rule ensembles tends to do better than DVM because the coefficients are fit explicitly. Um, this is a, a, a similar comparison on the classification side. So now the, the comparison is in terms of AUC. So higher values are, uh, are better. And, and again, um, we see that there is a smaller difference um, between DVM and rule ensembles on classification problems, at least when measured in terms of AUC. What I found in, in my uh, use of this method is that the model tends to be significantly more compact. Uh, the, the, the rule ensemble uh, model equivalent to, um, to a DVM model. All right. And so now, how do, we, how, how do we leverage H2O to fit these models in production? And so again, in, in terms of a pseudo algorithm, we, we, we are given a data frame, and we are trying to um, um, generate the rules and the coefficients. And so the two building blocks of rule ensembles is a process for generating the rules and a process for fitting the coefficients. And so uh, we start by leveraging uh, H2O's distributed implementation of GBM to fit the trees. And so let's say that we get M such trees. Then each of those trees, we throw away the coefficients of GBM, but the definition of the rules, uh, we extract them from the trees. And so again, um, every path from the root of the tree to a node in the tree it's a candidate rule. And so, so again, given M trees, we get M prime rules. Uh, um, the number of rules that you get depends on the depth of the trees. Now we need to create a new data frame where the rows are the original input observations, but the columns are the output of evaluating the rules on those observations. So we call that uh, new frame X prime. And then we supplement the, that uh, that data frame with uh, the original uh, inputs that are numeric. Re remember in the equation we have the rules and we have the linear terms. And that is the that new data frame is what we feed into GLM to get the coefficients. And um, at that point we can return the, the surviving rules and, and, and coefficients. So let me now talk about um, I, I think almost everything where, where we had to do some, a little bit of uh, around glue code to connect GBM with GLM. Um, and so the way we uh, extract the rules from the GM, GBM object, um, and so we, ex we generate the module, and then um, we... Um, uh, um, traverse each of the trees uh, printing the rules. And so it, 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 it was very convenient that uh, there is a, um, a print function in, in the a print module function that we could uh, follow the example of how uh, of, of the print module. And so we simply uh, traverse the trees, dumping the rules in a, in a JSON format. Uh, if you haven't seen this print module function before, so, so again, this is in the, in the um, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the package where, where, where this is, but it, it's, it's in one of the tools packages of, of H2O. And so this is the kind of graphs that, that the print module function generates. And so this is a visualization of one of the decision trees. The print module makes the thickness of the lines representative to, of the amount of data that is going in that direction. We see the split definition, the split variable, the split test. The, um, we see in which direction the NAs are going. And so we convert, again, we traverse this tree in this case, uh, in this simple tree, each of these nodes, um, each of these nodes, um, represents a rule, so one, two, three, four, five, six rules. So we represent this JSON file that, that is just a, a least representation of each of these six rules. I'm, I'm trying to pick up a speed now. Um, the, the next part is, is really cool, I think. Um, 
remember, we need to build a new data matrix where the entries in the data matrix are the result of evaluating the rules on each of the observations. Um, and so the, the way we do this in R, it's, it's, uh, so, so I'm going to show you directly the R code because, because it's really simple. We're given this list of rules in JSON format. And um, so again, we have like a text description of the rule. Um, but taking advantage of the functional programming characteristics of R, it's very easy to write this function, create rule function. So it's a function that returns functions. And uh, the, the, the first, the, the, um, so that's cool. The next part that is cool is that we just invoke this function on data. Data is the original uh, data frame as an H2O data frame. And just by, by mentioning this, that, that function that we just created gets shipped to the H2O cluster. And the function is evaluated there. And we just get a pointer to the vector that results from evaluating that rule represented by this function in the, in the H2O data frame. And then we just simply uh, do H2O columbine. We combine all those column vectors into, into the new data frame into a new data frame, adding the numeric variables and adding the, the target column. And that is what we feed to, uh, to H2O. And so this is, this is the way the output looks. And so every, so what we see here, um, every row here is a rule. And, and, and so for instance, this is, this is an example on a, a very well-known regression problem about diamonds, trying to predict the price of a diamond. And so, so uh, the first row here, the first rule, is a linear rule. And so here's a coefficient. And we interpret this the same way we interpret every linear model. We can look at the sign. And so we know what happens with the predicted price when, when carat weight changes. The next rule is, uh, the next entry is a rule of three variables, suggesting that there is a possible interaction between those three variables, and, and so on. Um, every rule has what is called a support, which is a, the fraction of uh, observations in the input data that the rule ap applies to when, when the rule fires, when the rule is true. In the case of linear terms, the, uh, the equivalent of support the, the, is, is the standard deviation of, the, of, the, of that variable. And so the, um, the standard notion of variable importance in linear model uh, generalizes to the rule ensemble, combining the magnitude of the coefficients and either the support or the standard uh, the, um, deviation of the numeric uh, variables. And so this allows us to present the rules in order of importance. Also, um, um, so again, the idea is that all these rules are human readable. And for every given case, you can see, OK, which rules fires in this case. If you need to come up with reason codes, every rule can be mapped to a reason code. This is, and, and so I don't know, these are the heavy diamonds, or these are the diamonds that have nice colors, and, and, and so on. Um, and, and the notion of um, the, the importance over the rules can be integrated to arrive at, at importance of the uh, individual uh, variables. Um, finally, in, in terms of deployment, um, uh, we took, um, uh, we took a, a, a different approach. And essentially, um, we are using SQL as the model definition language. And that, that might look weird at first. Um, 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 it, SQL is not Turing complete, but it has enough expressive power to express a uh, rule ensemble. And so, so this is the offset. Remember the, the, the equation of the rule ensemble. It has an offset. The next set of uh, the next few lines represent a rule term. In, in this case, it's a, it's a rule of three variables, uh, uh, of two variables, sorry, one numeric, one categorical. The next one is a linear term. And so normally, this linear term is the coefficient times the variable. The additional logic that you see here is what, what we call the Windsorizing logic. 
and so that to make sure that that linear term doesn't uh, explode in production. And so essentially, one of the advantages of this approach is that we publish the models as data, not as code. And so in environments where you have to publish models very regularly, uh, uh, publishing data, it's easy. Publishing code is, is subject to, other, to additional restrictions in, 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 in many organizations. The, the fact that the model is also represented as SQL, it means that we can uh, rely on any SQL engine that it's available to do offline scoring if it's needed. And so this, this expression, you copy and paste it inside a, a Spark SQL or inside of Hive, and the expression runs and, and gives you a score. And you get all the parallel processing capabilities of that SQL engine. Uh, in, in our case, when we do online scoring, we wrote uh, a Java runner. So we are separating the, the running part, the interpreting and running of the model from the model definition part. And so that, that uh, optimized uh, Java runner is not changing every day. What is changing is the, the model definition. All right. Um, and so um, I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Freeman. Uh, he's the inventor of rule ensembles. And over the years, he has uh, patiently explained many details about them to me. Uh, my colleague, James Bishop, uh, who helped me write the, uh, the Moyo parser, and Shayu, who was a, an intern in our group, a summer intern, uh, uh, got me started with some of the R code. Um, so how are we doing on time? I can't stop right there. Um, all right. Um, and, and so the, the x-axis was just a problem ID. And so uh, I, I said that uh, I connected the dots to make the graph easier to read. But uh, every, uh, uh, there were 60 problems, so there are 60 dots. Uh, is there an automatic tool to generate SQL, SQL of the model? And, and so, yes, in the, uh, I, I, I have a, um, an export program. So, so once the model gets fit, I, I have an export that simply writes the model definition as a SQL expression. Uh, is your work uh, available to others? And so um, internally, I, I call this package um, so the, the, this is like, like what I wanted to, to do. The, um, the, the code is called, I've been calling this code uh, Rigo. And so, so you see for rule ensembles go, there is, there is a train, there is a predict, there is one uh, for generating the partial dependence plots. There is a version of this that is in GitHub, but it's using Professor Freeman's implementation of rule ensembles in the back end. That is a single machine um, um, implementation. And um, so what I've been doing over the past year and a half is, is to replace his engine with the H2O capabilities. That, that the, so what is currently available on GitHub is, is the, the R code that is using Professor Freeman's engine in the back end. I still haven't gone through the open source internal process to, um, uh, to, to make this available. I, I'm also hoping that the, to get the H2O guys interested in this and say, hmm, maybe we should take a, a second look at, at, at rule ensembles and um, probably they wouldn't need to do some of the uh, function generation that I'm doing in, in, inside R. Um, I think that's it. S sorry, louder? I, guess I cannot. Uh, so so, so if, if, we, if you type Rigo, R-E-G-O, for rule ensembles go uh, on GitHub, you'll, you'll find it. All right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you.